Hi everyone, so we are back a little bit early and we have Dennis with us who will talk on databases on Kubernetes and why you should care. Hello Dennis, how's it going today? Hello guys, uh, uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, it's a beautiful day here and yeah, we back again. So can you tell us a little bit about your session and what's going to be about today? So um, <clears throat> I think that uh, in the list, it, it was int one interesting topic for me was that two years ago, uh, most of people were totally against running uh, state, uh, stateful uh, applications on Kubernetes. And it's interesting to see how uh, this completely changed in just a few years. And now we are talking about, hey, how can you also run stateful applications inside Kubernetes? Because that's the holy grail, right? Like that's uh, something super complex to manage. And, and that's essentially what this talk is about. So uh, how stateful applications uh, can run successfully inside uh, Kubernetes. Okay, oh. sounds very interesting. Oh yeah, so your slide is now on screen and you can start, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, thank you again for having me. It's really a big pl a pleasure to be here again. Uh, that's one, that's one of my favorite talks to be honest because I really uh, like this topic because a lot of developers are a bit skeptical about about this, uh, and I would like to show you guys today how uh, this is in fact uh, a very um, the state of the art in technology. I would say. And yeah, that's definitely something that uh, I hope you guys enjoy. So uh, for those who never heard about my uh, about me before, uh, my name is Dennis. I am, uh, let me just start my watch here to be, be on time. So my name is Dennis. I am developer advocate Catchbase. I have been working for uh, developing software for over 15 years, uh, mostly in the NoSQL and, and Java space. And I'm also uh, active open source uh, contributor. And I would like to start with a small tip for you guys. So whenever you are reading an article online, if the article starts with a question, the answer is usually no. Are all a real articles from 2016 asking, should I run my database on containers? Should I run my database on Docker? And back then, the conclusion of those articles were, okay, no, you should not do that. And the main argument was that containers were designed to be stateless, right? And that's, yeah, that's still true. Containers, in fact, were designed to be stateless. If we fast forward to 2020, you see that the articles now are not uh, questioned anymore. In fact, you can see articles uh, uh, since 2018 saying, hey, running databases in Docker at scale. And that's something super cool to see, like how we in just like two, three years, we completely changed our mind. And, and the natural question, uh, you can see that the articles now are not questions because they usually say, yes, you should run your 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 database or your state state publication of Kubernetes. And the natural question here is, okay, what have changed? Why in just two years uh, we completely changed our minds? There are a bunch of things uh, that changed since then. Uh, I would say the first one is uh, production grade images. So uh, pretty much all the, the, the this, uh, database providers now have official images and they tested the, 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 the database to be sure that they, it runs properly on Kubernetes. Of course, uh, running, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, running on containers, not on Kubernetes, but uh, yeah. And containers are definitely easier to set up and run compared to installing yourself on bare metal. You can also separate storage from compute, which is a really good thing when we're talking about big data in general. And of course, Kubernetes now in the last two years, which is essentially the, the uh, main topic of this talk. So, <clears throat> okay, let's say you want to deploy MySQL on Kubernetes, right? Uh, there's 
the naive way to do that is essentially you create a deployment and then specify the MySQL image and then you create a service to expose this image to the service, uh, to, to other pods. And then if you uh, apply this to your cluster, boom, that's essentially what you end up with. So uh, one MySQL uh, instance with a volume attached running in a, in a, single, uh, in a single worker. But of course, uh, if the worker goes down, goes down Boom, your database is offline. So this is not uh, much better than uh, running on a bare metal so far. Okay, so, you know, it's obvious that, okay, my, uh, uh, our database running in a single instance is not something that we should rely on because, yeah, uh, we won't have, like, high availability here. So you decide to run two MySQL instances now. But if you don't understand how Kubernetes works uh, and you never heard about uh, Interpod and Definity, you might end up with something like this. So yes, you have two instances running uh, uh, of MySQL now, but again, they are running the same worker. And if the worker goes down, boom, you lose the, uh, uh, your, both databases are not available anymore. Both instances are not available anymore. But the problem is that, okay, even if you uh, configure everything properly, and now you have two MySQL instances running in, two work in different worker nodes, still, if you lose one of the worker nodes, Kubernetes will eventually bring this node back because that's how Kubernetes works, right? Uh, so it will bring the node back, but we are talking about a stateful application here. Uh, so uh, Kubernetes will potentially bring this whole, this whole node back, but it, it is all empty, and it also has no idea that okay, you should also uh, be connected to this other cluster here and synchronize and have some kind of data replication. So even though we configure everything properly, it still feels like there is something missing. And yeah, with that, I would like to give my first demo here. So um, first, let's show you something. So Kubernetes allows you to do something like, uh, uh, we already have on Kubernetes some default types, which are like deployment service and, and let's say pods and et cetera. And then you can also create a new types there. So in this case, I will create a new type called to do. Right. This is uh, I could give a name, whatever name I, I want to, but I'm just to specify a new type and say, hey, Kubernetes, uh, there is a new kind of type here. If we compare to like application development, this will be similar to um, create a table in a relation database. So and in order to do that, all I have to do is to come here to my. Uh, so I have here uh, kube control get get nodes. I have three nodes running on uh, AKS here. And then uh, if I want to deploy this, insert this new CRD, all I have to do is to run kube control create minus F to do CRD. And okay, now I have this uh, to do CRD. And now I can insert uh, a new uh, type, uh, to do type on my, on my configuration on, on, inside, on, on Kubernetes. And I can define this new type to insert this new type there. This will be similar to uh, inserting uh, a, a new row in a table. So in order to do that, all I have to do is to run kube control create minus F to do dot YAML. Okay, and now because I have defined here on my uh, on my uh, custom custom resource definition uh, that I have the kind to do and the plural is to dos, I can run kube control get to dos and it will list all my to dos here, or I can run, run kube control uh, describe to do uh, by milk I think, and then it will describe this content. Okay, so this is uh, how we could uh, store a configuration inside Kubernetes. Why, uh, wh why this is important? So essentially, because I can uh, store the whole um, configuration of my database there. So essentially, let's say in my case, I work for Couchbase. So let's say I want to uh, store uh, the 
the whole configuration of a Couchbase cluster there or a Couchbase node. So I can define, I can create a new CRD, which I already did be before, and then insert a new type called Couchbase cluster, and then specify all the configuration of the uh, of the cluster here. Why is that important? Uh, because on Kubernetes we have something called the operator framework, and the operator framework uh, essentially allows me to extend Kubernetes to listen to events. And 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 the thing is, whenever I change something on a on on a CRD or on a when I, whenever I insert a new YAML file, it will trigger events, and those events can be listened to an application that will trigger some actions. So, for instance, whenever I uh, insert a new a new Couchbase cluster uh, YAML file there, um, the operator or will which is an it's just an application that I deploy on the Kubernetes cluster will listen to this event and then say, hey, oh, yeah, there is a new Couchbase cluster YAML file here. So let's spin up a, couch, a new Couchbase cluster according to this configuration. Or let's spin up if I insert like a new MySQL cluster, for instance. This application, this specific apl application will listen to this event and say, hey, there is a new MySQL cluster, uh, cluster definition here. Let's spin up all the nodes that we have. So uh just to show you guys how uh, this will work uh this this will uh look like on kubernetes we have the operator here the operator is essentially stateless it can run in whatever node it's actually one per namespace and then whenever you insert this new this new um yaml file it will listen and it will do whatever you have defined it to do of course um you have a, a specific operator for each kind of application. So let's say here I have a Couchbase uh, operator, but you can have you could have a MySQL operator, a Postgres operator, uh, Elasticsearch operator, and so on. And one of the cool things of operators is okay, uh, you can also uh, apply some uh, human knowledge there. So, uh, for instance, if a, po uh, a pod uh, dies or you lose a whole node, the operator will will listen to this event and say, "Hey, looks like uh, a Couchbase. Uh, we just lost a Couchbase pod here." Uh, and then the operator knows how to recover from that. So, it, it, so I I can lose a node, and then the the operator knows what are the steps to recover the database and bring this back to a health state. And the advantage of this is that I can essentially, uh, if I have a, a good enough operator, I can have a, something like a database as a service inside my own cluster. Uh, so let's do this uh, now live. Essentially, what I'm going to do here now is I already have uh, two things running here. So kube control get pods. Oops. Pods. So I have I already have two things running here just to save on time. Uh, so I have the operator and the where's my mouse? So yeah, okay. Go back here. Okay, I have two things running here. One is the operator, uh, which is usually provided by the soft vendor, or you can build your own operator, or you can just some use some open source one. And the second is the admission controller. Admission controller is just uh, how you can validate a configuration before it gets inserted inside Kubernetes because the operator only listens to events. And if you enter uh, the wrong configuration file, it will mess up with the operator because this, this is not a valid configuration. So the operator is just how you check and validate the state of the, the YAML file that you're inserting. And what I have to do to deploy, uh, um, let's say, a Couchbase cluster here. So I have here my secret, so secret YAML file. This is just means administrator and password. And to add this uh, secret here, I have to run kube control create minus f secret. OK. And now to deploy my Couchbase cluster, I can run kube control create minus F Couchbase cluster. OK, so uh, let me show what's happening here. So now if I run kube control get pods, 
in fact, let's say watch. You see that I already have CB example 000 here. What is happening in is in our Couchbase cluster here, uh, this is just an example. It could be, it will pretty much work the same with MySQL, PostgreSQL, and any other database out there, essentially. But what I have defined here is, okay, I want to deploy this Couchbase cluster, and I want uh, a bucket, uh, which is similar to a schema, called Couchbase sample with like 108 uh, megabytes and three replicas, so three copies of the data. And then what I'm saying here is I want three nodes, three nodes running data index query and search, which is essentially the service that Couchbase has internally. Uh, and what you can see here is that, okay, now we have CB example 001, and then it start, we have 00, 001, is 002, and hopefully soon they all will be available already. Uh, in the meantime, what we can do is, okay, let's also deploy an application to insert data, uh, run, dumb data in, uh, inside this uh, database here. So I already have um, here, <clears throat> so I have here a very simp a simple Spring Boot app that will insert uh, data inside Couchbase every X seconds. So let's, in order to do, deploy this app, I have to run Spring Boot, uh, I mean, Kube Control, uh, minus F, uh, create minus F, Spring Boot App Secret. So this is the password that the uh, Spring Boot application will use to uh, connect with the database. And then finally, my Spring Boot App YAML file here, which is nothing, there's nothing is super special here. It's just a, a simple application that I created that uh, Spring Data app that insert data directly on Couchbase. And now, hopefully, if we see here get pods, you see that, yeah, our, our database is ready. So what I can do now is let's forward the port to my machine here. So uh, I forward the port 8091 to my machine. And then uh, if I come here to Chrome, let's uh, bring a new, um, a new browser here, and I can access localhost 8091. So this is the Couchbase web console. So when you saw Couchbase, that's how you administrate uh, Couchbase there. And then I enter administrator and password. Oops. Password. And boom, here is the node that we just deployed. As you can see, we are already, uh, we are already inserting data inside the node. So this is my application inserting, inserting data. And here on servers, you can see that we have CB example 000, 0001, and 0002. Okay, great. So let's do one thing now. Uh, let's come back here. Uh, I mean, let's come back here to the bucket and let's add a new bucket here, which is again, creating a, similar to creating a new schema. And I will create here a new bucket called test. Okay, so now we added the bucket and we wait for the bucket to be ready and boom, the bucket uh, disappeared. Uh, why is that? Because remember, we have defined here that I want just one bucket called Couchbase simple. So the YAML file is a single source of truth, right? And what happens is the operator that I have deployed is, constant, is every X seconds comparing if this configuration here is the same that is configured, is the same as the real configuration of the cluster. And because I have added a new uh, bucket here, uh, when it checks that, it says, hey, there is uh, uh, some difference in the configuration here. You have defined that you have a catch base sample, but uh, in the real cluster, we have catch base sample and test. And then so uh, the operator essentially reverts this change. What else can we, can we do? So we are inserting data here. The database is live. Let's try something very aggressive now. So let's, we can, could try to just delete one of the nodes. So exactly what we described before. So uh, we can come here and say could control delete uh, pod cb example 0002. Boom. So we just lost 
and in three, two. Okay, boom, we just deleted one of the nodes. So if we will see here, get pods, we just lost one of the nodes of the database. And we've come back here, uh, you see that, oh, Couchbase uh, noticed that we lost one of the nodes, but uh, application is still live. Uh, not a big deal here because remember, uh, this is a distributed database, so we are uh, we, the other nodes can take over as we have replicas of the data. So the, no the nodes will be promoted to handle the, the, the requests that are being sent to that node. And then what will happen now is Kubernetes will bring this node back, but remember, this is a stateful application. So bringing the node back is nothing. It's still I still have to join the node, the the, the cluster, uh, join the the new node to the cluster and uh, trigger data rebalancing. So if we come here, you see that uh, could control get pods. Uh, you see that now we have CB example 003. So Kubernetes, uh, we had before we had CB, CB example 002. So Kubernetes already brought the new node back, and the operator will listen that hey, there is a new uh, Couchbase node here. I need to join this node to the cluster and to get data rebalancing. And that's the exactly So you see that oh yeah, we have a new node here, which is was just uh, added to the cluster. And then we need to move some of the, da the data that were here in those two nodes to this new one, because this, this new node here uh, was empty with no data at all. So he, ca he cannot answer uh, any uh, queries from, from the user. And you see that this is uh, happening automatically without any uh, human interaction. And yeah, and that's essentially one of the things so how you can have the, a the best like uh, experience inside your cluster. Uh, one, one important thing to highlight here is that in this case, I'm using ephemeral storage. So ephemeral storage uh, means that when I lose the pod, I lose all the data in it, but it also supports, naturally, it also supports uh, persistent storage, uh, local persistent storage and remote persistent storage. If I was using uh, local persistent storage here, bringing a node back would be something super, uh, super fast because then I just... Uh, schedule one not another pod to the same worker node and attach the same disk so I could recover this in like minutes but here I'm already like uh, given the worst case scenario so I lost all the data that I have in the pod and I'm recovering this automatically the other cool thing is okay what if I want to scale the, uh, what if I want to scale the 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 cluster now so instead of three I want four nodes now I have to do to uh, scale it up what is to come here now that I have defined size four here is to run the cool control see the outcome control replace minus f uh, catch base cluster and boom now uh, eventually as soon as the the rebalancing finishes the operator will start to uh, to scale is to scale out the database and then our next node. It's important to also highlight here that uh, um, so the rebalancing usually uh, is a very um, let's say um, there is some limits on how fast we we uh, rebalance database at uh, the database because the problem is when you lose a node, right? Uh, your performance already downgraded. So in the first case, we had like three nodes and we lost one of the nodes and then we are serving the application with just two nodes. So your performance is already downgraded. Uh, so when we add a new node, we, we, we are very careful, cautious with uh, rebalancing to not make like, okay, to not rebalance as fast as possible because this will uh, impact the performance of our application as well. So we are very cautious with, uh, we have some uh, performance limits on uh, how fast can we rebalance data just to avoid to uh, make things worse? And of course, uh, this is optimized for terabytes of data. Uh, so that's why it, it is a very, um, the transition is very is a very complex uh, implementation. But here you can see that, okay, okay yeah, we already fully recovered. Uh, if you come back here, could control get pods. You see that we already, uh, 
yeah, we soon we will start to add uh, Kubernetes. We'll soon, yeah. Now we already added CB example 004 because we just scaled up the database. Some other things that we could do as well here. Um, for instance, I could uh, let's say I have Couchbase six here, but if I want to um, run Couchbase six dot five. All I had to do is to run Couchbase 6.5, change to 6.5 here, again, go back to the console and then run kube control, replace minus F and apply this new the cluster configuration. Uh, in this case, the, the operator also knows how to upgrade the database. So it knows essentially how to upgrade the database and if something goes wrong, it also uh, knows how to roll back to the previous state. Uh, some other things that we can do as well, but this is more, I would say, more Couchbase specific. Uh, but in this case, we could do something like, let's say my application reads more than write. So instead of uh, scaling everything, I could say something like, okay, if my application reads more than write, I could have like four data nodes and 10 nodes running index query and search, or maybe search here is full text search because we also support that, but let's say you don't need full text search. So I can do something like this. So uh, now my application, if my application reads more than right, I can have scale just index and query and have just uh, four nodes or three nodes running data. Or if it is the opposite, I could also uh, run, let's say 15 here and then just three here because I, I don't query the data that, that often. I just insert data on it. And the beauty of this thing here is that uh, I can um, <clears throat> adjust the service, uh, I, I, I can adjust the hardware according to the service. So for instance, uh, data needs a very good disk, of course, so I can adjust the hardware there. Uh, index uh, needs more uh, uh, memory, so I can adjust the hardware uh, to have more memory there. Uh, same with query. So query needs more CPU. So I can, again, adjust the hardware according to the service that I'm running. And I have a lot of flexibility here oh, to boost the performer, to boost, to fine tune the database. Um, okay, so that's, hopefully we should come back here. Yeah, yeah, you see that now we are, we scaled up the database and yeah, you see CB4 and this is all happening while the database is, uh, is still online. So we are inserting data in the database. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of database and Kubernetes in general. It gives roughly the same uh, experience that we, you will have on uh, if you hire uh, uh, the best solution out there. Uh, okay, so let's go back to my presentation. Um, <clears throat> So there are a bunch of other possibilities as well. So for instance, uh, this operator, uh, I'm using the old version of the operator, but if you go to the new one, um, it also supports uh, automated backups. So you don't need to, uh, once you deploy your database on Kubernetes, it can automatically start doing backups for you uh, when you in a defined define time and then store this on a disk somewhere. So it's up to you. Uh, you can also configure, like, say, cross data center replication. So let's say you have, like, different uh, one cluster running in Europe and another running in in U.S. or in Latin America or in somewhere in Africa. Uh, so you, you can uh, configure replica the replication of data between those clusters. You can export all the metrics to Prometheus as well. So let's say you don't want to... Uh, you want to monitor some stuff on Grafana, so you, you can use the operator and the, the definitions here to export data there. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I would say that the future is essentially, will be something between choosing a database as a service versus running on Kubernetes. Um, Database, database as a service is, of course, is something super easy and you have a, a very low TCO. So uh, potentially you, in, in most of the cloud providers, there is, uh, if you have a small database, 
potentially the best might be a good thing for you because you, you can have like a good database for a hundred dollars a month, let's say. But the problem there is quite often it's, it lacks flexibility because you cannot fine tune their database. So if you need to get more performance, they only have, most of them don't have very limited ways on how you can optimize your database. Um, on the flip, on the other side, we have database on Kubernetes. With the major, the major problem now is that yes, uh, learning the learning cur curve on Kubernetes is still a little bit steep, so you still have to spend some time understanding how Kubernetes works before feeling confident to run a stateful application there. Uh, but I, uh, Kubernetes is already getting far easier than what what it was like one year, two years ago. So I suppose that potentially that's the the the, the default option in the future. So, uh, but we won't, we will stop essentially uh, running databases on um, on bare metal just because we have this whole automated flow of self managed self managed and self healing databases there. And guess what? That's exactly how for the Kubernetes and operators. It, it's exactly how Couchbase Cloud works. So if you say, hey, no, I don't want to manage the database uh, by myself. I want to, I prefer to go to Couchbase Cloud and just run the database there. Well, under the hood, we are going, we will be using the same uh, Kubernetes cluster and the operator. That's exactly how it works. And in fact, that's uh, because I'm in this field, so I I know how other companies are doing as well. And pretty much all of the, the other companies are also using Kubernetes and operators on the, their the best uh, database as service solutions, or they are migrating to this kind of a thing. So that's pretty much how, if you complain, hey, uh, just last week, actually, I answered a question on Reddit where the guy says, uh, hey, instead of use, uh, running database on Kubernetes, just hire the best instead. And I'm like, hey, that's exactly how it works under the hood. Like, it's, it's, you're still running database in Kubernetes there. Okay, uh, we also need to talk a little bit about uh, storage again. So ephemeral is um, uh, once you, you lose the pod, the, all, the database in, uh, all the data in it is also lost. So ideally, should not, that's not you should be using for databases. Uh, we also have a remote persistent storage. So in this case, uh, we are talking about uh, Ceph and Rook or whatever options you have uh, on Kubernetes. Um, the problem with remote persistent storage is that um, quite often you have uh, databases are uh, uh, disk uh, I/O bound, right? So they are uh, they write a lot to the disk. And for remote persistent storage, one of the issues is that the latency between the, the, uh, the database and the disk will uh, impact your query performance. So uh, you should essentially you should not uh, be using remote store, persistent storage unless you have a very good, uh, a, a very low latency between the, the node and the storage itself. Uh, and since Kubernetes, uh, uh, since Kubernetes 1.14, we have local persistent storage, and yeah, that's pretty much the, the what you should be doing with databases now. So with uh, local persistent storage, you get access to the disk where the node, uh, where the pod is running, so a local disk there, and then you you get like nearly the same performance as you would get on a bare metal. Uh, worth to highlight that. Um, yeah, I mean, let, let me just show you a graph here. So I just got this from KubeCon two weeks ago. And this is just a comparison between uh, performance of uh, remote persistent storage in, in, in blue and local persistent storage in red. So you can see that in sometimes local persistent storage is uh, essentially four or five times faster than remote persistent storage. So you de definitely should pr prefer while running a database, prefer to use local persistent storage. Another important thing here is that worth to highlight that local persistent storage is not uh, a general purpose storage solution uh, because again, you are writing directly to a disk. So uh, you, if the disk fails to lose the data uh, that you wrote in the disk, 
um, the, the disk is, of course, uh, um, not re replicated. And there is some other steps that you should uh, do to prepare the disk before doing uh, local persistent storage, uh, before using it for local persistent storage. So it, it definitely is not something that, okay, apart from anything that is not uh, I uh, disk bounded, uh, an application that is not disk bounded should not be using local persistent storage. And again, it's okay for, to use local persistent storage for databases because uh, pretty much all databases there already have some kind of uh, replication mechanism internally to copy the data from one place to another because yeah uh, we are very uh, databases one of the jobs of databases is not losing your data I mean the main job one of the main jobs of database is not losing your data so they are very good at replicating the data uh, between other nodes so that's that's why it is all right to use local persistent storage for the databases or whatever other applications that also keep copies of the data. Uh, in the past, we uh, before local persistent storage had uh, was uh, GA, we used we, we in general we used uh, host paths, and yeah, essentially you should not use host paths anymore at all. Uh, it has been completely replaced by local persistent storage. Uh, essentially use the the, the uh, volume claim framework so it's very similar to um, remote persistent storage so yeah that's important to highlight and one important topic uh, that uh, many people are concerned is what about performance so how um, uh, <coughs> sorry uh, how the, the data database performs uh, compared to a uh, bare metal. So roughly two years ago, we uh, th there is a famous benchmark for database called Yahoo Cloud Ser Serving Benchmark, and which has a different kind of workloads to test the performance of the database. So roughly two years ago, we did some tests uh, comparing Couchbase running on bare metal versus on, con on containers in Kubernetes. And what we found out was that, okay, for some types of workloads, uh, let's say in this case workload A, we we haven't seen any difference at all. But for workload E, which is okay, I query, I make a lot of uh, small, uh, short query ranges. So essentially, I ask for a few uh, documents every every few seconds. We saw that okay, the performance downgrade of running on on containers. Uh, was almost up to uh, 10%. So, uh, worth to highlight that this test was more than uh, essentially almost two years ago. And since then, some performance improvements have been made to, to uh, Docker. And also, I would say that uh, most applications are not uh, uh, using just uh, workload, workload A uh, type of queries. But it's still, it's rough. It's safe to say that your application running inside a container on Kubernetes should have a performance penalty of something already like something around two to five percent performance downgrade. Uh, I, all those tests, they are not uh, they are not cache based specific. So I think you can, can extrapolate that to other databases as well. So whenever you are deploying a database on Kubernetes, uh, make sure that uh, you add some extra CPU and and maybe memory to compensate this uh, two to five percent performance downgrade. Uh, this is uh, the, essentially the the results of the tests. So you can see that here we got like a minus one percent performance decrease for this workload A. Here's here in the workload A. Running on Kubernetes was even faster with okay, uh, faster than Bermetto. But here on the on the workload E, you see that we got almost ten percent of performance uh, decrease, downgrade. Okay, so uh, Kubernetes uh, is operators is already a big thing on on Kubernetes. 
Uh, you can actually build your own. There is a bunch of uh, famous operators out there. So, for instance, for Postgres, I think one of the most famous ones is one created by the folks from Zalando. And MySQL, uh, well, you have a bunch of options for a bunch of operators from MySQL. The ones for Percona is widely used, I think. And Red Hat uh, essentially created this uh, thing called Operator Hub, where they try to compile all operators out there. So you have like operator for Elasticsearch or whatever uh, uh, kind of application you can think of. And yeah, and I hope you guys can uh, maybe uh, this might be helpful for you and you can um, uh, start playing with Kubernetes and operators there because it essentially saves a lot of time uh, maintaining the, the database itself and other applications. So I have seen companies already that uh, they stop having, they they finally could stop having like a 24 by 7 support of DBAs because the operator can uh, um, recover from most of the problems. And in general, even if something bad happens, uh, usually the operator is good enough to to uh, recover after that. Uh, most of the operators, they are stateless. I forgot to, to, to mention that. So they usually s save the state inside uh, a ETCD, which is the uh, internal uh, um, Kubernetes database. So even if the operator fails, uh, it's all right. Kubernetes will bring the node back, the, the operator back, and then the operator will bring, will get its, its state from the ATCD. So yeah, uh, that's what I said. I uh, just want to highlight again uh, NatBit, which is a sponsor of the event and also Couchbase uh, partner. So if you guys uh, need some uh, consulting or need some support on NoSQL in general, uh, be sure uh, make sure to contact these guys. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Couchbase also has a, a, an event called Couchbase Connect. You can register for free here where we will discuss many things about NoSQL in general. So yeah, that's it what I have. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much, Dennis. So I believe Chitesh has gathered some questions from the chat. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, running databases on a, on a Kubernetes platform. Uh, okay, for those who aren't familiar with Kubernetes, can you do a quick recap brief comparing uh, the advantages Kubernetes have uh, and the disadvantages okay. of uh, uh, hypervisor VM, VMs? And in which scenario do you think VM could have a, an upper hand? Uh, uh, well, the the problem with I mean containers the advantage of containers in general, especially on Kubernetes, is you can define exactly how much memory and CPU you need. So instead of like say create a, a VM that your application might not be consuming all the memory or all the 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 CPU there, you can define exactly on you can better utilize the hardware you when you're using Kubernetes. Uh, containers are, uh, of course, uh, easy to manage in general. So uh, if you need to scale up and down, there's a bunch of, uh, of um, uh, mechanisms inside Kubernetes to be elastic. So for instance, um, in this case here, you can even make both your application and your database elastic. So let's say uh, you have, I don't know, Black Friday. So, uh, and if you define a set of parameters here, Kubernetes can outscale the application and the data and the database for you. Uh, one of the important things here is that it, it is uh, cloud provider uh, agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you are running locally or if you are running on AWS or on OVH or on DigitalOcean or Google Cloud, it will be the same configuration. And it allows you to kind of go to the, the, the places where uh, it is cheaper because pretty much works the same there. You have the same benefits everywhere. Uh, comparing to VMs, I would say that uh, if you have a very simple, um, 
if I have a very simple uh, application, uh, potentially VM uh, VMs is is a better for you because it's simpler to manage in general, uh, and there is a a, a, um, a big um, I say the learning curve. And to start with Kubernetes, you have to learn a lot of stuff. So in general, if you have just a few applications to manage, that's VMs might be a better solution for you. But otherwise, I, I think pretty much is is most of the companies are migrating to Kubernetes now. You also have an option to use uh, those uh, um, managed Kubernetes service, which is uh, uh, really helpful. It makes the life easier in general. That's exactly what I'm doing here. And yeah, and I mean, maybe I have answered the question. Uh, <laughs> do we have yep, any other questions? Uh, a very interesting thing you mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, whereby in case of failure of a node, it will auto restart. Uh, are we notified by any event, and is there any way to control its parameters? For say, if the CPU hits uh, 85%, uh, is there any way you could uh, do that? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, <clears throat> so in Kubernetes, we have something called pod outscaler and the pod outscaler you can define when should I uh, scale up the database instead of doing this manually I could say for instance uh, when not just the database but pretty much every single uh, container you're running you can say okay if the if the CPU is uh, uh, is on 80 percent for five minutes spin up a new node and of course, you can limit, okay, you can scale to up to 10 nodes or minimum three, two nodes. You can do all the sort of... One other thing that is super cool as well, which is since Kubernetes 114, I think, as well, is that you can define, uh, uh, you can define your, your own metrics. So you can say, if by, uh, by some reason I have, let's say... Uh, 10,000 uh, rows on the specific table here uh, that I'm using to as a, as a, um, as a queue, for instance, you can, uh, if I have over 10,000, scale up the, the pod as well to make, um, to my, for my applications to consume that. Or if I'm using, let's say, Kafka, and I have too many um, applications in the queue, uh, uh, message in the queue, I can also use that to scale my database. So you can define whatever, uh, uh, parameters you want to use with pod scaler to scale up and down your cluster. The cool thing that we also have in Kubernetes now is that, okay, what if uh, I want to scale up my database, uh, my, my, my application or my database, but I don't have more uh, resources on my worker nodes. So uh, on Kubernetes now, what you can do is when you don't have more, let's say uh, I need um, 10 gigabytes and three CPUs, but I don't have that uh, available on my on my uh, cluster anymore uh, because it's all filled out with other pods. So the Kubernetes cluster can request to the cloud provider or to whatever you are running uh, to start a new worker node. So you can uh, dynamically also scale up and down your Kubernetes clusters as well. Thank you very much for the answers, Dennis. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. I will definitely try to get uh, databases running on Kubernetes. Uh, Owen, do you have anything to say? And yes, it was a very interesting session and running database in Kubernetes is something a lot of people really uh, wonder about and if it's actually gonna work or not regarding persistence of, uh, uh, of data and all. And I think this really enlightened us on some of the ways to make this happen. And thank you very much for this session. Okay, thank you for having me guys. And yeah, see you soon. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me on Twitter. And yeah, I will be, I will share my slides soon. All right. See you guys. Bye bye then.